Good afternoon, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to this webinar, uh, part of the 2020 ESB IIEA lecture series entitled Rethink Energy. Um, I'd like to particularly thank the ESB for their sponsorship of this event, and it's great that so many of you have been able to join us today. We are delighted to be joined by Alla Weinstein, uh, founder and chief executive of Trident Winds Incorporated, a deep water offshore wind project development company. Um, I, maybe a special word of, of thanks to Alla for being so kind as getting up at or joining us at about six o'clock in the morning in her time. Um, uh, Alla is a founder of Trident Winds, a, a as I say, deep water offshore wind project development company. She leads the company's efforts in developing a commercial scale uh, floating offshore wind farm off the coast of California. Um, Alla has been in the field of marine renewables for the last 20 years. She currently serves as energy appointee to the Washington State Coastal Marine Advisory Council. And she's the US Department of Energy ambassador to the Women in Clean Technology Initiative. She's an active member of the American Wind Energy Association and a frequent speaker, both in the United States and in Europe, on the development of renewable energy. She was first president of the European Ocean Energy Association. She knows us quite well here in, in Ireland. Um, she'll speak to us about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll go into a, a question and answer session uh, with uh, you, our audience. Uh, you'll be able to join that discussion using the uh, Q&A function on Zoom. You should see that on your, on your screen. And I'd urge you to um, send your questions throughout the session as they occur to you. Um, you don't need to wait till the, the end. And it's helpful to us all if you identify yourself and your affiliation when you ask a question. Um, a reminder that today's presentation and the Q&A session is on the record. Um, you're also, of course, free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Now, it's my pleasure to hand over to Jim Dollard, Executive Director for Generation and Trading at the ESB, to offer some introductory remarks on today's most timely topic. Jim. Thank you, Owen. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, and I suppose our special guest, Ella Weinstein, uh, you're all very welcome. I am pleased on behalf of ESB to welcome you to this discussion, uh, the Rethink Energy Lecture, the fifth in this series, a uh, series we did in partnership with the IIEA, and a partnership that's been in progress with the IEA for over a decade, and a very successful partnership. Today's lecture from Ella is very timely, as we aim for 70% renewables by 2030 and indeed beyond now to 2050. Ireland has set very ambitious targets and 2030, as we all know in project development terms, is today. It's not tomorrow, it's today. To deliver 2030, it's actions today and beyond. ESP has played a huge role in renewables since its foundation in Ireland Crusher was a renewable investment. And in recent years, um, we continue to make strides in that regard. Renewables has, has, is now playing a huge role in the Irish energy uh, industry. Uh, I think over the last 30 days, I looked at this yesterday, 47% of the fuel mix in the last 30 days is from renewables. So it's a very significant figure and one that will only grow towards that 70%. Wind has played a huge part in that uh, and Ireland has been very successful. We now have over four gigawatts on the system, which is an incredible achievement for an island nation. But the challenge ahead, no doubt, as we move way beyond that to 70% is significant. ESB has and will continue to play a huge role in renewables. Um, in the last year, we've, we've commissioned two major wind farms, both in Oaninny uh, with our partners, Bordnemona, and Grousement, which is one of the largest wind farms in Ireland. So 150 megawatts delivered, and that is in onshore wind. But more and more now, we know that the future will more and more depend on offshore wind. And in recent years, recognizing that, ESB has invested heavily in offshore wind, both in Britain and Ireland. Over the last two years, we've taken a minority stake in the Galloper Wind Farm. We have 50% of Nart Naguiha Wind Farm in construction off the coast of Scotland. And we've just announced 50% acquisition of a development project, Inch Cape, which is 1,000 megawatts. 
that's in Britain. In Ireland, we have major ambition for offshore wind. We see offshore wind in the coming decade and beyond being, de- being a huge bulwark for the delivery of Ireland's targets. I suppose we've grounded that in terms of the Oriel Wind Farm, which is off the coast of Dundalk. And I hope most people will know now we have a major partnership with Econor, which is looking at a number of sites around the coast, on the east coast, the south coast, and indeed the west coast. I suppose I'll conclude with saying we see offshore wind being a huge part of ESB's future. We see floating technologies as being essential in doing that. And as ultimately we, we look to harness what is a huge resource off the West Coast, floating offshore wind will be part of Ireland's future and ESB's intent in playing its part. So in conclusion, I want to really welcome Ala today. It's a really exciting time to have her speaking with us and really looking forward to her address. She has deep experience in offshore wind on two different oceans and she's an influential policymaker in the area. Ala, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, last time I think I spoke to this audience was probably around 2013. And um, as I was um, um, founder and CEO of Principal Power, the company that developed floating support structure. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here now talking about more um, implementation of projects rather than technology. Yes, we need technology, but it's just technology, right? If you don't use it, it just becomes a nice toy. So I'm going to talk about how uh, offshore wind, and in particular, the, the, the offshore wind of the, of the west coast of Ireland in deep water could be contributing to your ambitions. And the ambitions are significant. When I read the papers, just to get myself familiar with where Ireland is today compared to 2013, it was impressive to see that you want to deliver almost 30 gigawatts or 35 gigawatts from offshore wind. Um, and I hope most of that is going to be from deep water because shallow water, as you probably well know, uh, the sites are becoming kind of scarce because there is just too many installations already. So we're going to start, to at least what I thought I would do is I will do three topics. Um, the first one is the state of the art of floating offshore wind technology. It is important to realize that we are past the technology um, um, inventions. We're even past probably technology prototyping. We're really entering the commercial stage of technology um, exploitation. I'm going to talk about the California experience because that kind of led to a lot of lessons and then look at Ireland and floating offshore wind and we'll conclude with a short video that I want to leave with you to underline that same point. We're in a time when floating offshore wind is becoming commercially, vi- uh, commercially deployable and that's what we're going to be seeing in a very short time. So. Looking at the world, I think it's important to realize um, that most of the best wind resources are really located in the water depth greater or deeper than 60 meters. 60 meters is a, is an accepted breakpoint between the use of fixed foundations and floating foundations. And just by looking at this map of the world, you can see how much there is darker color rather than the lighter color. Sorry, yes, Anna, continue- um, will you share the screen, please? That's has- I, oh, I'm not sharing the screen. Sorry about that. No, no, that's. I thought I was sharing, but we will. Hmm. Yeah, there you go. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Okay. And you can see it, right? Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, you want so, to go on full, full screen, it's, uh, excuse me, if you bring it to full screen. Yes, it is full screen on my screen. That's it. That? No, that's great. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Um, so if you see this chart, which is the chart of the world and the world oceans, you will notice that the darker color, which is really deeper waters, there is a lot of more of it than lighter colors. Um, continental, outer continental shelf of every continent will vary in its width. And in some parts, like the West Coast of the United States, um, actually most West Coasts, it's going to be fairly shallow and fairly narrow rather. So even in Ireland, 
you know, the part that on the West, yes, you will have certain amount of, of uh, outer continental shelf, but it will drop to below 60 meters fairly quick. So effectively, if you think about it, the fixed foundations of your wind is kind of intermediate step. I think what we're going to see going forward is going to be a lot more development in deep water offshore wind. Now, I wanna make a little bit of a step back and say what is happening and why do I say that this is going to be happening? Back in the 70s, you may remember that offshore oil and gas exploration moved from being fixed foundations to floating. And effectively for the same reason that there was more resources available in deep water than there were resources in the shallow water. Well, the same thing is happening with offshore wind. We are moving from fixed foundations, which is the picture on the left-hand side, where the foundations are sitting in the bottom of the ocean floor to floating foundations, which is similar to what happened in the oil and gas industry in the 70s. <clears throat> Technology principles of how they work and all the um, hydrodynamic uh, capabilities really do come from the oil and gas industry. The industry also gives us another advantage of not only proven technology, proven principles, but also regulatory and environmental impacts. We can see how things move and how things work in the in marine environment, and we can derive a lot of lessons which we have because the basic principles are very, very similar. And so, Yes, today, what we see is exactly what happened back in the 70s in oil and gas industry. We're moving from fixed to floating, and that's where the future of offshore wind lies. So today, uh, there is quite a number of uh, technology, te technology development. Um, back in um, 2008, when I started Principal Power, uh, there were only two of us in existence. First was uh, Equinor, formerly Statoil, that installed its prototype of high wind in 2009, and Principal Power installed its first prototype in 2011. It's interesting for me to go back to that time when I um, met with uh, uh, European Wind Energy Association back in 2008, looking for some funding to develop technology that may have been available at the European Commission, the answer was, you're a little too early, come back in about 15 years. Well, we proved them a little bit different and uh, we were able to go to Portugal um, and with a combination of EDP and Portuguese government, we were able to put the funding together and we did prove them wrong. We had a prototype two years later, not 15 years later. And it's hard and it's really good to see that 10 years later, um, the European associations recognize that floating offshore wind is here and now, and that is the future that we need to look at, pay attention to. So while technology development continues, it's important to also realize that we are now in the pre-commercial stage of deployment. And as we move forward, we're going to see that we're going to be looking at commercial developments, no longer prototyping, no longer demonstration projects. We really need to understand and realize that we are entering the stage of commercial deployment. And because of that, our needs are different. It is not R&D funding. It is not wave tank. It is not test centers. It is really port infrastructure, consenting, um, uh, purchase of energy. Those are the elements that become important to get this, this industry going. So just to show you where there are, there are three, three companies that are as the front runners. There is probably at least three or four behind them that's going to enter similar stages in the next few years. Equinor, as I said, was the first one that entered the space with a 2.3 megawatt demonstration in 2009. Then they installed 30 megawatts in uh, Scotland in 2017. And next year, they're going to install 88 megawatt um, high wind tempered project that will now connect uh, green energy generation with oil platforms and effectively power oil platforms with the energy from the wind. Now that's important because it's no longer one or single device, it's 11 eight megawatt in, uh, uh, floating platform installations. And that will be installed in 2022. 
it is already under construction, um, but it takes time to construct. And so that's what's happening. Principal Power, on the other hand, installed its first device in 2011. Um, that's a two megawatt demo. What's interesting about that device that after it completed five year, very successful testing, it was disassembled and then moved to Aberdeen and then reassembled. So not only did it work for five years and demonstrated all its capabilities, I believe that's the first ever in the offshore wind history that a device was able to move from one body of water into a different body, body of water put together and operating now for the next, I don't know how many years. But that's important that we actually demonstrated not only that the turbines work very well on floating support structures, but it also that they could be suitable for multiple bodies of water, as long as your wave climate and wind climate is similar. Wind float Atlantic, which is the picture actually you see in the middle, was installed in um, this year, a couple of months ago. Um, and that is um, uh, already 25 megawatts. It is sitting in Northern Portugal around Viana de Castelo. And whenever you can go there, I suggest you go there and take a look because it's impressive to see those things installed. But what's even more impressive that already today, just about a month ago, the units for the Kinkardine project that will be in um, uh, south of Aberdeen or southeast of Aberdeen, um, that will consist of five nine and a half megawatt turbines are being installed as we speak. And going looking forward, uh, there will be another installation in France in 22, 23. So by the time we get to you know, the end of, um, uh, or rather in, in the next couple of years, we're going to see a lot more installations. Uh, Ideal, which is a French developer, they have, kind of chose a little bit different approach. They had more demonstration project. There was one in, uh, in Europe, um, which is a two megawatt turbine and it is on a concrete, concrete structure. Then they did another demo in Japan using steel of the same technology, but they now use two bladed turbine, which was a Japanese turbine. And there will be a four unit installation in 22, 23, again in France, that's going to use six and a half megawatt turbines and there will be four of them. So that is important to recognize. We're not anymore doing prototyping. Yes, there are new ideas, new technologies that are coming up and they're doing the prototypes in various parts of the world, but we're really going towards commercial deployment. And that's important as it comes to Ireland. I think you will be better served putting your mind and money and time into commercial deployments rather than starting from scratch. So looking down the road and seeing where we're going to go from that. Um, here is just a picture of what was installed this year. Oops, I'm sorry, I went the other direction. This is the installation in Portugal, as I mentioned. Uh, and, it, and I wanted to show you the picture just so that you can get the size of scale. We're not talking about small devices. We're talking about very large pieces of equipment. And with that comes the need for the infrastructure that can support these pieces of equipment. Just to give you an idea, this is the fabrication of the Kinkardin wind float units. Just look at the size of the units and look at the size of the uh, vessels that would be required to transport them. That will, you will hear me say that time and time again, infrastructure matters, where you can build them, how close to the installation site that can be done matters a lot, matters in the time of cost. And that's what needs to be understood from day one. Then when you start developing what you're going to create, not only does bring a huge economic benefit because of the capabilities that you will be able to realize, but it also depends where is the infrastructure that those capabilities could be using. Now, this is just a snapshot that was put together by Quest uh, Floating Wind Energy to look at where we're going to be in you know, the next decade, I would say. And we're going to be looking at significant amount of installed capacity. We could be approaching two, three gigawatts around the world of floating offshore wind. And that's important to realize that put your effort, put your money, put your thinking, into commercial deployment of floating offshore wind because that is where the future is. 
with deployment, with scale, comes reduction in cost. We're on a pre-commercial arrays, we're going to see significantly higher prices of anywhere between 180 to 240 uh, euros per megawatt hour. It's really the commercial arrays and the commercial exploitation that are going to drop the price significantly and will be approaching potentially fixed foundations and maybe even lower uh, uh, levelized cost of energy because floating offshore wind eliminates a lot of somewhat bottlenecks that fixed foundations have, and that is the amount of work done on shore. Most of the devices will be built in the port and towed and installed in their complete assembly wherever the installation is. Because of that, you're going to eliminate need for a lot of heavy lift vessels and, 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 and equipment that requires to be used for the, for the assembly onshore, offshore. Um, and, and you will be able to install more in a same period of time. <clears throat> now, I wanted to give you uh, an example, and there are some lessons learned that came from that example. When I left Principal Power in 2015, I started Trident Winds for a simple purpose. We need to move technology into exploitation. Well, you can't start exploitation on the west coast of the United States when people were talking about offshore wind, but not really seriously, without doing it at scale. And so what I did is initiated the project in California for a gigawatt, 1,000 megawatt of installed capacity. In the United States, you have two levels of um, kind of permitting, so to speak. First of all, we have federal waters, which is really outer continental shelf beyond the three mile limit that belongs to the state. And in the state waters, you're going to have different requirements based on the state requirements. So under the federal uh, law, you will apply to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management that is basically authorized to lease the outer continental shelf for renewable energy development. And the state in that case will be doing what's known as a consistency review, but you're still going to be crossing the state waters of three miles. And so because of that, you have to work with both um, agents, with both bodies of, of government, federal and state. And so back in 2016, on January 14, Trident Wind submitted the non-solicited lease to request to Bowen. What is the difference between unsolicited lease and the auctions that you may have heard about? The difference is who requests the lease. Uh, a state may request Bowen to assess its waters and, and prepare auctioning of the ocean floor to potential developers, or a developer can initiate a lease request, and that's exactly what Trident Winds did. And effectively, January 2016, woke up California to offshore wind. They were not prepared for it. Now, five years later, it's a very different story. People are aware of offshore wind and they know what they want to do and they know where and how we're going to proceed. What's important also is to realize that you have a lot of conflicting users of space and these conflicts have need to be resolved. Why do we not have an auction in California yet? Because there is a significant conflict with the Department of Defense. Until that conflict is resolved one way or another, we can't proceed. Conflicts will slow down the process. The earlier they are addressed, the better it is. Now, in California, um, in uh, uh, two years after the unsolicited lease request was submitted, California state law required passed a bill, or state legislation passed a bill called SB 100 that required to supply 100% of electricity from renewable energy and zero carbon resources by December 20, uh, by December 45. Since the um, unsolicited risk request, and particularly in 2018, uh, Trident Winds form a joint venture with ENBW North America. ENBW North America is a 100% wholly owned subsidiary of ENBW Germany, uh, the large, one of the largest utilities there. And jointly with, um, uh, we created a company called Castle Wind. So Castle Wind conducted a study to see how and what benefits will be, could be derived by California from offshore wind. So as a result of this initiation back in 2016, Boeing have concluded that there are now a lot more developers interested in offshore wind development 
And in fact, there are 14 of them that expressed an interest. And now we're moving through the competitive process that will resolve in the auction as soon as um, the conflict with the Department of Defense is cleared. But what's important is when we did this study to see the value of offshore wind to California, the study was con conducted, um, as I mentioned, it was commissioned by Castle Wind, but it was conducted by a company E3 that does a lot of analysis. So the graph on the right is an interesting chart that shows you the value of energy at the different time of the day. Now, California has a lot more sun, st sun than Ireland, and so it has a lot of uh, solar. But as you will see, this dark line is the value of energy, so the cost. The more energy you have, the lower your value is, the less the energy you have, and demand is higher, the higher the value is. So when the solar is speaking in the middle of the day, your value of energy is the lowest. When the sun is not there, in the middle, you know, at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, and your demand is higher, the value of energy is higher. This line is offshore wind. Now compare that line to all the other sources, onshore wind, out of state wind, solar, you have the highest value to California coming from offshore wind. And the reason is it's profile, it's blowing 24, hour, 24 hours a day. It is available where the population is, and this is just the numbers. And so as a result of the study that pointed out that if California wants to achieve its target of SB100 at the lowest cost, Offshore wind has to be a part of the mix to the tune of 10 gigawatts by 2040 in order for it to impact these targets. That's important. So the lessons learned from the California experience so far, because we have not yet had an auction and we're not really doing a project per se, conflicted uses of space need to be resolved from the start. Do not underestimate public perception and the need for stakeholders engagement. We have the laws that actually discourage, unfortunately, developers to do early stakeholder engagement. Trident Wind did that because of the unsolicited lease request, but it's paying its benefit. People are coming on board, people are understanding the benefit of offshore wind. Infrastructure. West Coast of the United States does not have any infrastructure to support the development of the structures as I showed you in the picture. All that infrastructure is in the Gulf. Of, of, of Mexico, not on the West Coast. Distance to port where you're going to be assembling the devices is your main cost driver. If you don't have a final assembly where you can put the turbine on the floating support structure or on a port close by, you're going to end up with a very high cost of energy. Transmission capacity matters. Whatever you generate, you need to be able to put it somewhere. If you don't have capacity in a transmission, then you have to be able to do some storage and that becomes important. Off-takers and the off-take regime matters as well. And supply chain, in order to attract the supply chain, you need a guaranteed pipeline. 10 gigawatts would be great if we can have it as a commitment from the state of California saying, this is how much we're going to develop. Because then supply chain will invest in creating its capabilities. If it doesn't have that demand guarantee, then you're going to be bringing things from somewhere outside. And so effectively the bottom line, industry, developers, supply chain, need commitment in volume. If the commitment and volume is there, then things will happen. And it's not even so much as the energy pricing while it's important at the beginning, it's really that demand commitment that will drive prices down and it will attract private investment. These are all the lessons that I learned. Now, when I started to look at Ireland, it became kind of interesting. I have to admit, because I had to do some research, it just be, you know, time passed and I wasn't really looking at Ireland recently. But I found some interesting, some interesting things. First of all, Ireland has a significant um, space offshore as compared to your land mass, right? So if you think about it, you have three times or maybe four times offshore space as an economic development zone versus your own shore space. And if you can utilize that offshore space effectively, you'll be able to significantly benefit from exporting energy rather than importing energy. However, when you start overlaying things like 
marine life, like shipping lanes, like other conflicting uses of space, the space becomes less. And whatever authority is that manages the consenting and the permitting really needs to take a hard look at these conflicting uses of space and do some marine spatial planning and say, here is where we can do offshore wind development. And this is the level of what we can do. It becomes important. As you can see from the chart, the wind resource is best in the Northwest Ireland. If that is where things could be developed, that would be great. But as you will see on the bottom of the ocean floor chart and the colors, this part you know, is about, about 100 to 200 meter water depth. That's great for floating offshore wind. And if it can be made available, you can generate a lot of it. But obviously generation of what you can do there will be a lot more than the island needs for its demand, meaning that you need to think about where am I going to put it and can I store it and bring it to other demand centers. <clears throat> so uh, Sustainable Energy Authority Ireland predicts that 30 gigawatts of energy would come from offshore wind. That's terrific. These are all the benefits that Ireland can derive. Now you just have to do it smartly and exploit it as quickly as you can with paying attention to what really matters. And this is another study I found from the Carbon Trust that kind of puts some numbers on what the target should be, <clears throat> what port infrastructure would require in terms of its repurposing and the opportunities and how many jobs it can create. I think these jobs are actually underestimated for three and a half gigawatts, maybe you will get that. But I think if you go to 30, you're going to gain significantly more economic benefits and jobs benefits, but you have to start somewhere. And so, yeah, I think the kind of trust footprint and, and roadmap laid it out pretty well what needs to be done. But even the better paper did a better job. And that's the Airwind, the, um, the, the roadmap for offshore wind development in, um, in Ireland. I agree with everything that was stated there. And I was quite impressed at how well that paper was put together in looking at the holistic approach of what needs to be done except for one item, demonstration projects. You do not need them. They've been done around the world. And it is much better off to spend time and money on something that can advance two things, installations of commercial projects and storage. Offshore wind, and especially floating offshore wind, provides you two advantages in storage. One is physical storage because you have deep water and deep water has pressure. So you can actually store energy on the bottom of the ocean floor using compressed air and then discharge it when the need is. But even a better one is hydrogen generation because you can combine systems and their size allows you to put things next to each other, you can do hydrogen. And with all the developments that Europe has, which is significantly more advanced than US, hydrogen will be the driver of the economy. And that's where the demonstration should be taking place in combining and demonstrating storage rather than just a, a floating offshore wind demonstration. This have been proven. There are now probably 15 to 20 different demonstration projects around the world. Take advantage of what somebody else is doing and do it the way it could advance things much faster. So the critical path out of that same document is again, perfect, except demonstration project, skip it, you don't need it. Just go directly to commercial exploitation, 100 megawatts to 700 to 1000. In California, we're going to be doing commercial projects immediately because that's all that matters. If you wanna achieve your levelized cost of energy as needed, and if you wanna achieve your benefits as you want them, you wanna to go to commercial exploitation. So I wanna leave you with one video so that you can see how and what um, uh, can happen. And I think I need to do something here. There we go. To run this video. But I think it's important to realize that today you don't need to do demonstration. You need to do commercial exploitation. You need to prepare your ports to accept this type of equipment. This is a one minute video from a transportation of the wind float support structure from Spain to UK, which happened less than three weeks ago.
So the future of offshore wind is floating. I didn't want to say that, DNVGL did 10 years ago or 2013, the same year I met you guys. And that's what you need to do. And I think you have great opportunity to do it. You have a perfect plan that AirWind presented. Now you just have to implement it. And if you skip the demonstration part and only focus on storage, hydrogen or, or, down, or, or um, underwater storage and create your infrastructure to be able to do it. And most importantly, put the targets in place. And I think you are going to see a great uh, benefit from offshore wind and especially floating offshore wind on the West Coast. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Alo Weinstein. It was a, a very stimulating uh, presentation and I see questions are starting to flow in. But um, I, I mean, just that last uh, minute of a video, the scale of these things is just enormous. Uh, but I think you've also underlined the scale of the opportunity. Um, you've talked about, uh, well, SEAI have talked about uh, 30 gigawatt. Um, someone who I think you've come across, uh, Eddie O'Connor has talked about uh, 75 gigawatt. Uh, Ireland is a major uh, uh, source of clean energy for, for Europe. So the, the, it's, a, it's a really exciting uh, prospect. I think another theme though that you've, you've uh, emphasized throughout your, your uh, presentation there is the, the infrastructure, the need to um, have the right kind of, uh, I mean, a, 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 a late, much lamented uh, colleague of mine, Owen Sweeney, had a phrase which I thought uh, summed up uh, the challenge before us. Um, he, he spent a lot of his life working on the development of um, offshore renewables, and he argued that Ireland had, of course, some of the greatest opportunities um, in Europe, if not on the planet, uh, in relation to our size. But Owen would said, uh, we have choices to make, though. Is our role going to be a participant in this development or as the suppliers of the sandwiches to those who are making the development? So um, real challenges here. Um, and Michael Omani has the first question here, and he's, he asks, how challenging an environment is the west coast of Ireland for offshore wind development and will wave activity influence the choice of floating technology? Ala. Well, um, the Atlantic Ocean is not as bad, <laughs> I would say, as Pacific Ocean. So the wave climate in the Pacific Ocean is actually more severe than it is in the Atlantic Ocean, especially around Ireland, just because you have such a long fetch from Japan to the west coast of the United States, you're allowed to build up of winds and waves and all that stuff. So I would see that Irish west coast is actually a better climate for structures that will be more cost effective. Because when you put a structure in the Pacific Ocean, you have to make sure that it's going to survive the storms that you're going to see there. You're not going to see the same intensity of the storms in the Atlantic, especially on the west coast of Ireland, as you would in the Pacific. But it's all the matter of design. When you start designing, you're going to take your 50 year storms and that's going to be your mid ocean conditions to which you're going to be designing it. So it is, it, is, it is usable and it is reasonable. The wind float, the first device um, that was installed was installed in Portugal and while the wind resource was not as great as it is in Ireland, the west wave resource in that part was actually worse than it is in Ireland, just because again of a long fetch and where the location is. So you do have actually very good conditions where the structures don't have to be over designed to withstand severe storms just because of where you're located and, and, and the wave climate and the depth, what a depth. In California, we're in a thousand meter water depth. In Ireland, you are up to 200 meter water depth. Big difference yep. in how you design and what the costs are going to be, especially for the mooring part. So you actually do have much better advantageous, advantageous conditions for the floating offshore wind. Very good, thank you. Uh, we have a question from our former Minister for the Environment, Climate and Communications, uh, Dennis Nocton. Um, he asks, 
in light of the scale of the onshore infrastructure and the plans to decommission Money Point, a, a coal-fired uh, uh, plant over there uh, in Shannon, is it not an ideal site in the Shannon estuary for manufacture and assembly to service Atlantic deployment of floating turbines? Um, I can't say whether it is or isn't, but I will say that whoever is the agency that's going to do the planning, whether it's developers or the government of Ireland, need to look at two things. Where is the minimum or the least conflicting users of space that would allow installation of offshore wind? And then look at onshore infrastructure that could be repurposed or redone to allow development and, and assembly of these devices. If you can build them locally, you're going to increase your job significantly. If you assemble, assemble them locally, meaning you're going to be able to put turbine on the floating support structure, just the ability to do that final assembly is basically going to bring you 2000 jobs per each gigawatt of installed capacity for the period of construction time. So do your numbers, they're very simple to do of how many jobs I'm going to get somewhere, but the distance to port matters a lot. Okay. And so when you know where you can install, look for the shoreline and look at what can be repurposed. And yes, construction will cost money, but if it adds about a hundred million per gigawatt of installed capacity to redevelop a port, as long as you have scale, that is something that makes sense. Good. Thank you. Um, Denise Horan turns attention back to your, your own experience. Um, she thanks you for a very interesting presentation and she says, what specific stakeholder challenges do you or your projects uh, encounter in the United States? What level of community involvement? Well, because Trident Wind submitted unsolicited lease requests and because we had to do a lot of things um, up front, um, we worked with the local community of the city of Morro Bay and with the local fishing community and, and put in place um, community benefits agreement and mutual benefits agreement with the fishermen. That was done, I think, the first time in the United States where it was done before the auction are actually starting. And that became extremely important because you give people the sense of knowledge before you come in and say, I'm going to do it. You know, nobody likes surprises and nobody wants to see things in your back ocean or the backyard. And so giving people an opportunity to accept the fact that it will happen and be somewhat part of it maybe is important because your perceptions matter. And what I found out that while the prototype installations did a lot of work on assessing devices and the impacts on the marine environment, we don't have a lot of published papers on the environmental impacts of the floating support structures. That is something that would be good to do, especially from these installations that are happening now to actually go and get some data collection and publish the papers to say, here is what it is. This is not a prediction. This is an actual data. That mere fact of the actual data and ability to give it to environmental community, fishing community, local stakeholders becomes an important element because this is not perception. This is not prediction. This is what will happen. But you know, when the only data we have today is actually from fixed foundations, but they're very different. You know, you're going to have mooring lines and cables where fixed foundations, they all buried. So there is a lot of differences between, and it would be good to get that data together. And so maybe one thing that Island can do is have your researchers do these surveys of installed, installed farms and get that environmental data that would be beneficial to everyone. Very good, thank you. Uh, um, Andrew Gilmore, who's Deputy Director of Research at the IIA asks, how important are organizations like the North Seas Energy Corporation uh, in developing Europe's offshore wind grid? Um, what are the consequences for Irish development given that the UK has left um, this organization, the North Seas Energy Corporation? Um, I don't think I can answer the question of how important it is or not important, but for Ireland, 
because you have an opportunity to generate a lot more energy from offshore wind than you can consume, uh, you have two choices to make. One is energy storage, which is really compressed air or, <clears throat> or hydrogen, or exporting that energy. And exporting energy means cables, means wires somewhere. Back in the days, Eddie O'Connor had an idea of um, uh, super yep. grid. I don't think that really got to the point where he wanted to see, but his statement of 75 gigawatts of installed capacity was connected to the ability to export that energy to the continent. If that can be implemented either through physical wires or storage, well, that's your export potential. Not only do you bring all the jobs that you can, you know, of thousands of jobs per each gigawatt of installed capacity, you now have the export revenues that you will be able to benefit from. So I can't answer with any specifics, sure. but these are concepts of what needs to be really done. Um, another policymaker, member of the European Parliament, uh, Kieran Koff, who actually is a rapporteur for a key a committee in the Parliament, he asks, is the EU emissions trading scheme fit for purpose as more renewables come on stream? Now, this may not be your particular area, Allah. Um, well, it's not. That said, it was the, uh, what was it called? It was called uh, Renewable, uh, no, it was New Entry Reserve uh, funding reserve. that allowed installation of the wind flow at Atlantic, the three units that I showed you. So yes, the emission schemes are important. Emission schemes allow projects to be built. And as long as the future is building commercial projects, your emission schemes will allow them to happen sooner, faster, because it gives the commitment and because it allows financiers to be able to finance projects better, especially the new technology. The new entry reserve was a great program that allowed a lot of new technologies commonplace. Windflow Atlantic is one of them. Very good. A pioneering one. Yeah. And Peter O'Shea, who's head of corporate and regulatory affairs at the ESB, he asks, on current projections, how big will individual turbines be in 2030? And can, That's an excellent question. And, and can we, a second part, can we anticipate an, an increase in load factor? So. I think the answer is yes to both. So here's the example. Uh, California unsolicited lease request 2016 planned on eight megawatt turbines. As we are now looking and doing front end engineering design, we're already looking at, or started rather, with 10 megawatt turbines. As we're finishing up in just one year, we're already starting to look at 14 megawatt turbines. By the time we construct, who knows, we may be at 17. It really depends on how technology can advance and still be possible to construct. At some point, you're going to get to, uh, to sizes that we just cannot handle. But Owen, you, you reacted on exactly what I wanted you to react on when I did this video, size. We are talking about very large structures. Very large structures need very different infrastructure than you had before. We're not building ships, we're building platforms, they are different. And so, yes, turbines have been advancing incredibly in their capacity. And by the time we get installed in 2030, 2025, I would not be surprised if it would be 15 to 17 or maybe even higher capacity turbines. Wow. Load factor, um, they are increasing the load factor. Look at GE's when they announced their 12 megawatt turbine, that already showed you that their capacity factor is much higher than prior turbines. It all the matter of the designing and efficiency of the turbines themselves. And so it is conceivable that we will see higher capacity factors and the load factors as well as the time moves forward. Okay. I have a closely related question from uh, Roscoe DC from uh, uh, EY Ireland. He, he asks, um, why is proximity of construction infrastructure on land uh, so important if the floats and the towers can be transported 
um, so easily on, on water? Could Spanish or Portuguese ports provide capacity to offshore Ireland? Think about the time that it takes you to transport. Now, let's assume that each unit that you install will need to have major repairs done once in its lifetime. So once in its lifetime, you're going to move this unit from its location to the place where you have to do major changes. Just calculate the time that it takes you to transport the units between wherever you are and to wherever you need to be, multiply by the quantity of units, put the emissions on it, put the cost of fuel on it and time, and the answer will become very obvious very quickly. Okay, thank you. Um, Ailish Scott in Ervia asks, do you see the integration of offshore wind and hydrogen as key to reaching our net zero emissions target? I certainly do. Hmm. And that's where you should be putting your research money in. System integration. While the bits and pieces of technology exist, we do not have a system complete. We do not have that demonstration. We do not, did not refine these elements. And I think that's where <clears throat> Ireland can actually excel is you as you let developers choose the technology that's going to be used instead of spending money on demonstration project on demonstrating floating ocean wind technology, which have been demonstrated, spend the money and time on demonstrating hydrogen integration because that will enable the floating ocean wind <clears throat> become the base load supply. If there is storage associated with the generation of the intermittent resource, you have a base load supply of energy and that could be great. Plus, it can be also delivered to, you know, transportation sector. And if transportation sector moves from electricity to hydrogen, you immediately have another supply of energy. Interesting. Thank you. There's a question from Owen Collins in Matheson, uh, the law firm, and he asks, do you see a role for corporate off-takers in helping offshore wind projects get built? Or do you think the main routes to the market will be support schemes or wind farms operating on a merchant basis? It's the former. Uh, and users are very important to the, uh, to, for being the off-takers, especially in the United States <clears throat> where the schemes are very different. We don't have necessarily governments buying it, especially in California, which is really different from any other state. The state does not buy power. The power is bought by utilities or the community choice aggregators or the end users. And so already today we're looking at the end users as they are my as our main buyers of energy. So yes, corporate end users are very important to the whole industry. And no, the industry should not be relying on the government support schemes. That would be fine at the beginning just to kickstart things. But as you move forward, it needs to become market driven and that's why the end users become the market drivers because they're the end users how 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 challenging for the industry um uh, are we just at this at this point in time we people talk about the valley of death as we move out of the demonstration phase as we <clears throat> seek to scale up to become a major industry for the uh, floating wind is that is uh, because Fixed base wind is is uh, to a considerable extent mature now, isn't it? But floating, uh, what uh, what are the challenges in, in making that transition to a commercial industry? Well, um, I wouldn't say that the floating offshore wind is in the valley of death any longer. I think it's on the other side. <clears throat> but what you need, you don't need this money to do demonstration. What you need is support schemes to do the first commercial installation. After that, volume and economies of scale give you an ability for the levelized energy cost to be market competitive. And so I wouldn't put it as a valley of death. I put it as support of the front end or first projects. Remember that chart that shows the cost of the pre-commercial arrays to yeah. the commercial arrays? Yeah. That's where you need that support to say, okay, 
like the NER 300 that did for Windflow Atlantic. You know, they covered the delta, partial delta, of what it will cost to build a small installation versus a large installation. And that's what you want to be paying attention to, just to kickstart and cover this delta of cost because economies of scale are not there yet. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm just looking at another question that has just come in addressed to yourself and to Jim Dollard from the ESP. <clears throat> um, uh, and uh, it's from Michael Doyle, who's a member of the IIEA. Um, he, he says, he points out the, the new Dublin array proposal for an offshore wind farm 10 kilometers off the coast of Dublin. Um, uh, that, that's something which there's public consultation going on at the, at the moment, a, a very sophisticated website, actually, very interesting. But um, he asked, would larger floating wind turbines located further out in the Irish Sea be a technical and financially viable option for Dublin, or alternatively, the transmission to Dublin of electricity generated from offshore floating power, uh, platforms further away in the Atlantic? Um, I, do you, Jim, want to come in on that? I mean, uh, Ala could hardly be expected to be familiar with uh, the Dublin Array uh, proposal. Well, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to answer it on, on. Maybe I'll just take a little bit to say, think about your scale again. Um, scale matters. If you have a large installation, your distance to to the delivery point, which does cost money because it's a cable is going to be amortized over much larger volume of energy generation. And so I'll turn it over to Jim. Obviously he knows a lot more specific, but scale over cost becomes a very important factor. Very good, very good. Jim. Thanks, uh, I think on the East Coast, I mean, the, you know, the development of the East Coast is going to be uh, more likely to be fixed uh, rather than floating. The resource scale in terms of, as you say, relative to the West Coast, is small or still a very significant resource in the context of Ireland, but relative to the West Coast, the West Coast is a vast quantity of resource, which as Alice showed in our graphs goes way out into the ocean. It's a much more limited, um, I suppose, palette when you look at the East Coast. The East Coast is well advanced now as well. Those projects that people are talking about, they're in the mid-decade horizon. And I suppose people are working now to existing technologies. So I think, you know, the government has talked about five gigawatts of offshore wind and the East Coast is going to form the, the bulwark of that over the next five to 10 years. Those projects are in flight now. And I think if you like the decisions are made that they're going to be um, you know, fixed in nature. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, Ala, I think um, at this stage, I'm, I'm looking at the time and I think we're going to have to bring things to a conclusion. Even though you're starting your day, we're heading into our <laughs> afternoon. But we're the time the, just to underline the timeliness of your intervention, because just yesterday, the uh, European Commission published an EU strategy on offshore renewable energy. And I think it's interesting that some of the newspapers headlined the ambition of this uh, plan, of this strategy, for a, a, a 250 percent increase in um, uh, the scale in, in what we were seeking to realize and actually they left out a zero they're talking about a 25 fold increase so uh, uh, going back to uh, my initial reaction to your remarks about the the scale and the the excitement inherent in what you're uh, talking to us about and now you're telling us about experience it is a very exciting prospect that you've told us about today and I think that we are all uh, in this large audience very much in your debt. Thank you very much. And also thanks for being up so early in the morning. <laughs> Thank you, Ella. Well, Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to talk about things that can happen. And I think you have a tremendous opportunity. As Jim said, you know, the amount of resource you have, the amount of space you have, few countries have as much. So use it. Thank Let's you. Spend the money wisely. Thank you. Thank you. That's Bye -bye. Good. Thanks very much. Bye-bye now. Thanks.